So next I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Gerald Zimmerman. He has been a specialist for 28 years in the field of physical medicine and rehabilitation. A longtime friend of our network, Dr. Zimmerman has had many years of experience dealing with polio survivors, including a number of our members. His practice as a physiatrist ranges beyond post-polio treatment and rehabilitation. He works to increase or restore functional ability and quality of life in patients with injured bones, muscles, and tissues, including those suffering a wide range of physical disabilities and deficiencies, such as brain injury, stroke, multiple trauma, and spinal cord disorders. Dr. Zimmerman is a 1982 graduate of the University of Illinois College of Medicine at Chicago. He practices in Englewood, New Jersey. Today, he will talk to us about minimizing our risks and maximizing our strengths, emphasizing gait abnormalities. Dr. Zimmerman? Now, can you hear me? That's better? OK. All right. And, uh, hmm? You want me to hold it? Leave it. How is that? Is that better? Now everyone's through the whole room now? Everyone can hear? Okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, and hopefully I've given this little doodad to make this work, so hopefully this will go without a glitch as well. So I would like to thank Jean, uh, Joan, and the board of directors for giving me the opportunity to be here with you today. Uh, as, as already mentioned, I've had the privilege of working and hopefully helping, helping some of you who are here today. I always appreciated the fact that I might be doing something right because no matter the interval, uh, many of you keep coming back to see me in the office. For that, I am truly grateful and humbled, and I certainly look forward to meeting more of you here today. When Jean asked me about a topic, I immediately said that I want to talk about gait and walking. And she uh, told me that's not a topic that's been discussed before. So it seemed to fit into something new for everyone. Uh, because of my background and training, uh, the analysis and management of these problems is always something, as strange as it may seem, that I've always enjoyed. Uh, while the primary topic may be about gait abnormalities, I hope to use this information also as a bridge to the understanding and management of other non-walking musculoskeletal problems such as fatigue, weakness, uh, pain, and loss of function that occurs in post-polio syndrome. So I hope that this information will be relevant to everyone, no matter what your mode of mobility, and that there will be something for everyone here in the presentation. I will try to point out how some of these concepts are relevant as we proceed. I don't think you have to be a physician to constantly marvel at how our body works, although I don't think most of us give it much thought as we try to get through each day. However, as a physician, I've had the opportunity to take a peek with wonderment into the science that makes us tick. While I don't think that most people want a science lecture when they visit the doctor, you just want to know what's wrong and how something should be treated, I do think that some exposure to this science can be a revelation. It is my hope that understanding or at least seeing some of the science will help make a better connection with treatment recommendations to know what is and what isn't possible. Uh, although I chose this topic because of my academic interests, I also did so. Uh, I also did so because I see this theme with so many patients when they first come to see me. One of the most common complaints, and we'll see in a slide of uh, symptoms, is that I'm having trouble with my walking. It is so important to everyone who is still able to walk that I think it is worth uh, further discussion. Okay, well let's. So in today's uh, presentation, I hope to uh, uh, present a, a brief review of what we already know about uh, post-polio syndrome, a review of how our muscles work, including some anatomy and physiology, and I'll discuss principles of exercise of muscle and muscle fatigue. I'll then review uh, what we know about normal gait, and that would lead into a presentation of abnormal gait and its management, and then how normal and abnormal gait affects energy consumption. So you can see that the fatigue issue will be uh, throughout this talk. And then I'll give some final thoughts. 
so before I get started with uh, talking about post-polio uh, and gait in specific, I just want to give one case study so we can put a, a little face on to what we're going to be talking about. So this is, uh, the, the, the initials have been changed, but it's a real story. So this is a 62-year-old woman who had polio at the age of two with residual weakness in her left leg. Uh, she used a, an AFO, a short leg brace, until she was five and, and no devices uh, since that time. And over the years, she's had complaints of chronic pain in both legs, both her arms and in her lower back. When she came to see me, uh, she, her current complaints were she was falling more frequently over the past year, she was having more difficulty with her swallowing, and she still had the chronic pain and increasing fatigue. At the time of her initial evaluation, she told me that she had fallen six months earlier that resulted in a fracture of her left femur uh, for which she had uh, surgery. And postoperatively, she began using a rolling walker but no other devices, and she used that rolling walker inconsistently. Uh, she found that she was unable to walk more than 20 feet with uh, the development of both uh, fatigue in the muscles and general fatigue and being tired, and that she was tired with any activity. And so she tried to focus and she told me she tried to focus on her feet while she was walking. And in terms of her background, uh, she had been working full-time as a nurse for many years, and most recently, uh, up until the time of her uh, accident, uh, as, a as a nurse in a nursing home on the floor where she often had to lift uh, patients uh, to help them with their transfers. Since her surgery, she had not returned to work. Uh, oh, that's louder. And, um, and uh, she had not returned to work. Uh, she lives in a second-floor walk-up apartment, and at home, she helps with the cooking and cleaning but she finds that she isn't able to stand for more than 10 minutes. On examination, uh, her left, shorter was, left leg was shorter than her right, and she had atrophy throughout her left leg. She had a normal range of motion in all four extremities except for the left knee, which lacked 35 degrees of uh, flexion with the onset of pain in the uh, knee and the thigh, and she lacked uh, full uh, movement of her left ankle. There was moderate weakness in both shoulders with severe weakness throughout her left leg. She had no anti-gravity strength in her hip flexors or her quadriceps and mild weakness in her right ankle. And she, because of all this weakness, she had multiple gait abnormalities that involved both legs, uh, but her balance was better with the rolling walker. So I wanted to just talk uh, real briefly about the diagnosis uh, of post-polio syndrome. Uh, and I don't really have to tell you too much because it's pretty well accepted how it's diagnosed. And, and given on the slide here, plenty of uh, uh, books and pamphlets that now have been written about the topic. And I think there's a, a pretty well accepted approach to the diagnosis and treatment. And I'll have some more slides later on that. So just briefly, to before we get to the main topic about the diagnosis of uh, post-polio, and later you can tell me if I'm missing something. Uh, there are four primary uh, components that someone has to have a previous history of polio with a partial or complete recovery after the episode, but it doesn't exclude people who've had uh, bulbar uh, polio or non-paralytic polio. Uh, at least 15 years of clinical stability after recovery from the acute illness. Abrupt or gradual onset of new weakness, muscle fatigue, or generalized fatigue, and the exclusion of other conditions with similar presentations. Uh, looking at the symptoms that people present with on uh, first evaluation, 75% um, uh, of people do complain uh, here. There's my little button. No button. But you can see that uh, on walking there, 75% of people do complain about problems with their walking. And uh, in addition to 70% or more complaints of fatigue, uh, muscle, and joint pain. And this is just another slide with other studies showing similar um, uh, pieces of information in that the fatigue is usually the most common complaint, but as you can see, the weakness can be up to uh, over 85% as well in previously affected muscles. So what I want to do now is just uh, briefly review the accepted concepts of uh, the cause of post-polio weakness. Uh, this involves the motor unit. And I think you may have seen some of these slides before at other presentations. But I'm doing this because it's an important introduction as we talk more about uh, muscles and muscle, uh, uh, the muscle physiology itself. 
so the motor unit, uh, so there we go, uh, consists of the, uh, there we go, the anterior horn cell and the spinal cord, its uh, axon, and then the, um, its, uh, its sprouts as it uh, goes into the fibers of the muscle. Um, and there is an anatomic distribution in the spinal cord itself so that you can see that 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 there can be a an anatomic uh, distribution here uh, in in that the flexors are on the top the extensor muscles are on the bottom and this may help to explain why there's some as asymmetric weakness uh, seen in polio uh, after the acute onset the uh, motor neuron fiber ends in a bulb at the neuromuscular junction, and this is the motor fiber here, and this is the nerve ending, uh, where acetylcholine is released as a neurotransmitter, uh, which causes the contraction of the muscle fiber, and this is the, uh, the muscle fiber down here, as I mentioned. So in acute uh, polio, as, as everyone's aware, uh, there is a destruction of the anterior horn cell by the uh, virus itself. And that will leave uh, a destruction of the, of the, the axon and the, and the nerve fiber and will leave motor fibers uh, orphaned. And in the recovery phase, then, then the uh, surviving motor neurons will then form new sprouts to give innervation to these orphan motor fibers. And that if, because if they're not uh, re-innervated, then those motor fibers will uh, die in atrophy. And then as we progress from uh, the normal to the onset of post-polio syndrome and the weakness and the symptoms that we see, that the concept is that, that there's recovery via this axonal sprouting. And then uh, over the years, the uh, remaining motor units will uh, degenerate either from overuse or possibly from aging, leaving fewer fibers available, causing weaker muscles and possibly new atrophy, as you see down here. Okay. So all of this leads to uh, all of this has to do with muscles, and not just those that are used for walking. So what I want to do now is to talk about a little bit about muscle anatomy and physiology, as we need this information to think about how we walk and how we use our muscles for all our different activities uh, during during the day. So I first want to present a little picture of, of what muscles are about in the gross to the microscopic anatomy of muscle. So if we think of a full muscle here that we see just on our arms, I mean, we have the skin and other tissues covering it, but the muscles themselves are made up of muscle uh, bundles here, or fascicles, and in each fascicle there are bundles of fibers. So this is a muscle fiber that's innervated by each one of these sprouts that we talked about coming from the motor unit. And each of these uh, fibers then is made up of my further microscopic units called myofibrils. And these myofibrils are then made up of these myofilaments that can only be seen under electron microscopy. And these myofilaments then are the proteins uh, that produce the contraction of the fiber. And if we look at this at, a, at, the, at this microscopic level, the myofilaments consist of both thick filaments, what are called thick filaments, which are called myosin, and thin filaments, which are called actin. And while on the schematic, the, these th dark, thick lines are actually the thin filaments, and these thicker lines here with the little cross hatches are the what are considered the thick filaments. And so the basic unit is called the sarcomere, and this is an electron mic microscopic picture of, of a sarcomere, and you can see that it's not just one little thing here, but there's probably millions of these things in each, in each uh, muscle fiber. And these are what are responsible for causing the contractions that we can produce when we try to move our muscles. So the sarcomere, these, the sarcomere then is what produces tension that uh, eventually results in the contraction of the muscle. The tension itself depends on the uh, sarcomere length and the relationship between the, the thick and the thin filaments. So the most tension will develop when there's the greatest overlap between uh, these two different types of filaments. So you can see here the difference between the, the length of the sarcomere, which is between these two lines, and the tension that the, the fiber will 
will produce. And the, the greatest amount is here when there's here the greatest overlap between these two different types of myofilaments. And that when they're either full, far apart or overlapping, it, it can't produce as much tension. So this makes intuitively makes sense. Now, when you're looking at these fibers, these fibers have to work in certain ways. And when we go back to just the fibers themselves, um, not all fibers are created equally and not all fibers are the same. So even though they may look the same on an electron micro micrograph or when we look at muscles or you look at a piece of meat, everything looks the same, it's, it's not all quite the same. And it's been determined through staining and other evaluations that there are actually two different type of fiber two different types of fiber, muscle fibers that exist in our bodies. And they are conveniently called type 1 fibers and type 2 fibers. They're also called uh, slow twitch and fast twitch because of the way that they work. Um, and there are different uh, functions for each type of fiber. And I want to present this just so you understand what's going on in your muscles when you make a contraction and that it's all not just simply a, a contraction. Now, you may know this kind of concept of uh, different kind of uh, muscle fiber types from uh, chicken and poultry, and that we know that there's, uh, pardon the, to the vegetarians, but you've probably seen this anyways, uh, that there is uh, dark chicken meat and white chicken meat, and it's that way because there are different fiber types that make up each of those kinds of meat, that kind of muscle, because the, the meat is a muscle, um, and that the muscle in the poultry is used for specific um, tasks. Okay. So while in poultry there may be a predominance of one fiber type in the in the breast meat uh, here versus the thigh meat here because of the task that performs for the chicken in humans, uh, it isn't so. And uh, while and, and in in humans, there's more of a mosaic type with all three types of fiber types. It's types 1, type 2A, and type 2B that are found in each muscle. And the amount of each fiber type varies depending on the function of the muscle. So this is just a staining of a piece of muscle from a quadriceps of a 20-year-old man that was stained for uh, enzymatic uh, activity. And you can see that there are different colors here. And the type 1 is dark, type 2B is a medium color, and type 2A is more on the white side. Okay. So each fiber type is there because it has its own physiology, physiological characteristics that depends on the task the fiber is asked to do. Type 1 fibers here are uh, slower in their speed of contraction and produce less force than the type 2 and the type 2B fibers, which are faster and stronger. Now, in humans, uh, when we these muscles, these are uh, pictures of muscles that would be stained, and you can see that some are darker and some are lighter. And this is uh, because of the presence of other enzymes in the muscles that uh, for the staining purposes. But the type one fibers are, are darker staining than the type two fibers here, as we saw in the other picture as well. Uh, the type two, one fibers are for longer lasting tasks, while the type two fibers are for or the fast use of muscles. The type 1 fibers here are called slow twitch and are used for longer needed activities. And while we're, I'm not a runner either, uh, just as a conceptually, this is for long distance running or for walking or tasks that are going to take a long time to do. And we use these type 1 fibers. And they use oxygen as their means of uh, metabolism, whereas the type 2B fibers are, that work fast are used for something like sprinting. And they don't, and I'll show you in the next slide that they don't use oxygen and they just use their own intrinsic um, uh, energy that's used up very quickly. So this is what's happening at a cellular level in our muscles as we move them, whether we're walking, pushing wheelchairs, walking on crutches, or whatever we're doing, or even blinking our eyes. Okay, so this is just a, another review uh, to give you an idea of these types of uh, muscle fibers that exist. And that, 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 that to take away from this is that, that the type 1 fibers that last a long time in terms of their fatigue, and they fatigue, they're very fatigue resistant, use oxygen, they can produce high levels of energy molecules. Whereas the type 2 uh, B fibers that are used for sprinting and very quick activities um, and produce the highest tension very quickly a very low resistance fatigue and fatigue very quickly. Okay. 
And this is just a picture. I don't know how well you can see this or not, but it's just to give an idea of the, 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 the difference between the two types of fibers and that the type one fibers are, are used for long lasting actions here called enduring actions, whereas type two fibers are used for quick actions such as moving our fingers, uh, you know, blinking our eyes, uh, those types of activities. And there's not very much, if we call ATP as the energy molecule, there's not a lot available. So it has to be done quickly, whereas every uh, uh, molecule of oxygen can produce many molecules of energy to allow us to do activities over a long period of time. Okay. So now that we've uh, put all these muscle fibers together, we want to look at, and back in the fascicle, and the fascicle back in the muscle, and we have that muscle all put back together again, what do we do with all these muscles? So there are a number of different functions of skeletal muscles uh, besides just the walking and the pushing things around that we do. But the, the first uh, thought of function is that it produces movement of our skeleton and our joints, such as with walking. Muscles also maintain posture, such as in our spine, and stabilize joints, such as in our shoulder. It supports and protects soft tissues so that it'll protect our bones and cover our bones, uh, but it also protect internal organs such as uh, our abdominal muscles where there isn't any bone to protect anything. It controls body openings and uh, passages in the terms of sphincters. It assists in respiration with our diaphragm and our um, uh, secondary respiratory muscles in our neck and in our uh, rib cage and it maintains body temperature through heat production. So we've all been in the cold, especially in this winter, and we shiver, and we shiver, and, it, and that's the muscle producing heat. Okay, so when we exercise, we do so to improve strength and aerobic conditioning and keep the muscles as healthy as possible. So I want to review some of the principles of exercise. Uh, and again, this is good for all muscles, no matter whether you are healthy, not healthy, polio, not polio, everybody uh, has same responses to exercise. And uh, we'll put some caveats for, uh, for the polio um, affected muscle. So when somebody exercises, uh, there are many organ systems that uh, become involved, and they all interact in a way to allow increased blood flow to the muscles, to remove waste, and to release endorphins. So it includes the cardiopulmonary uh, system, the endocrine system, hematological system, our kidneys, and psychologically, it's a benefit, and we all know that, to exercise whatever we can do, and that's where the endorphins come in. So when we think about how one want, when we think when when it's thought about how one wants to exercise, and if I'm writing a prescription for exercise, there are certain uh, principles that need to be followed in order to uh, maximize the benefit from the exercise. So I just want to review some of the principles of uh, training, and this is for normal muscle um, as compared to muscles that have been affected by the polio, and then we can make some of these uh, adjustments uh, as we go along. So the first thing is that there has to be set specificity of the task. So um, you have to ideally practice the task that one wants to do. Baseball players hit baseballs. You know, uh, basketball players throw hundreds of basketballs to learn how to shoot. We, you know, walk to walk. And you don't want, if you're going to be pushing a wheelchair, you don't want to be working on your leg muscles. So you have to work on the muscles that are going to do the task that you want to do to get the best uh, benefit from the exercise itself. Um, it's known that in normal muscles, you have to overload the muscle to fatigue to get an increase in strength. So you need to tax the muscle beyond the usual daily requirements. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about fatigue in a little while. Um, and also to think about the role of fatigue. And we know all about this with uh, uh, muscles that have been affected by uh, polio in the past. So this is not for polio, I'll call them polio muscles, but for normal um, healthy muscles, they have to be uh, brought to fatigue if you're going to try to strengthen the muscle. 
One has to identify the intensity of the and the level of the work which will be performed, high intensity, low intensity, uh, and then the duration and the length of time that one wants to exercise and the number of repetitions. So for some people it might be high repetitions of a low weight, low repetitions of a high weight, how you bring somebody to fatigue, uh, bring muscles to fatigue are all part of the um, what, what one looks at. And then finally, the uh, frequency of the exercise that one wants to do. And there has to be some rest after uh, after uh, bringing a muscle fat to fatigue. That's why it's usually recommended that one exercises for strength or cardiac effect you know, every other day to give a chance for the body to recover from the, uh, from the fatigue. However, we know that studies, and there have been plenty of them now, that have shown that uh, non-fatiguing exercises can work for uh, muscles that have been affected uh, in terms of any kind of a neuropathy, whether it's from polio or from diabetes, other uh, conditions that cause neuropathy. And we do know that uh, bringing muscles to fatigue in a normal way does run the risk of causing increased weakness, which is one of the problems that people run into when before they come to see the doctor and haven't been to uh, presentations like this. And again, we want to consider the specificity of the exercise for uh, what you want to do. So again, you, if you're going to be uh, propelling a wheelchair or if you're going to be using a walker, you really want to work on your arm muscles, but do it in a way that's not fatiguing because uh, the studies have shown that you can still improve strength, just not to the same degree that it would be if you were, had normal muscle. Now, when exercising muscles, there are different kinds of exercises that one uh, can do. And uh, they are all, and when they are used, they're physiologically different. So I just want to present this because this becomes important when uh, thinking about how we walk and how we use our muscles when we walk and the role of exercise to try to make uh, gait uh, better for people. So there are three types of uh, contractions, and you may have heard of some of these, and some of these you may not have, uh, that are available to us to use when we try to strengthen muscle. So there are isometric contractions when there is no change in the length of the muscle. Uh, there are concentric contractions, which are shortening contractions. So when we think about the, how we usually exercise a muscle, you bring a barbell up and move it up and down, that's a shortening contraction. And then there are eccentric contractions, which are lengthening contractions. And um, this is just a, uh, excuse me, a uh, picture to show the idea of what these are to conceptualize the difference between uh, the isometric contractions here where there's no movement at all. You just hold the barbell in one place and try to contract your muscle to keep it there. A concentric contraction brings the barbell up towards you. And an eccentric contraction, you allow the barbell to come down slowly. So you don't use the muscle in the back, you're using the, muscle, the biceps in the front to bring the muscle down. And this is important because the forces that each type of these contractions uh, can generate uh, differ. And so they're not all the same, and that's important in terms of what our bodies are trying to do and what we want to do when uh, we exercise. So a concentric contraction actually produces less force in the muscle than an eccentric contraction, and it's also dependent upon the velocity of the movement. So if an isometric contraction where you're not moving the muscle at all is, is, is at zero in the middle, you can see that it produces more force here than a regular contraction no matter how fast you move it. Uh, but that also it only goes so far because we don't do isometric contractions usually to do an activity. You don't pick things up in an isometric way. You use a concentric contraction. And then uh, the eccentric contractions, the length of the contractions produce the most force. And the faster that uh, velocity of the movement, the higher the forces that this produces. And this is why a lot of times people uh, will exercise, people who do weightlifting and do bodybuilding will use eccentric contractions to try to exercise to get bigger muscles because this produces the greatest forces. But this becomes important for us, as we'll see later when we talk about walking what our muscles do. Okay. 
So I said during the principles of exercise that we want to strengthen the normal muscles by exercising them to fatigue. So we're always talking about fatigue. It's all, and we talked about fatigue at the beginning in terms of the presentation of symptoms. So I just want to uh, give a definition of uh, fatigue um, and then, uh, and then uh, what, what some of the symptoms are. So fatigue, muscle fatigue itself can be uh, thought of as an inability to maintain a needed contraction from prolonged you. So we know about fatigue. You get the, you don't get fatigue sitting here. You get the fatigue when you're up and moving around, and then all of a sudden you get pain or weakness or something hurts or you get tired in general. So that's that's the fatigue that you're experiencing. And fatigue physiologically is necessary uh, to prevent damage to normal muscles. So when someone's exercising and they get fatigue, they know they can't go any further, and their body makes them stop. Um, when when people who are used to pushing themselves, you don't listen to the fatigue, and we've talked, and people know this from the, the uh, some of the thoughts of what causes post-polio symptoms, that if people push through their fatigue, they don't listen to their body telling them that things are tired, that the muscles are tired, and they, they hurt themselves in this way, and we'll talk later about how uh, pacing and resting is part of the uh, treatment uh, protocol now. So some of the subjective symptoms of muscle fatigue include muscle soreness, stiffness, and pain, and I imagine many people in here have experienced those symptoms. And objectively, people can note a decreased rate of exercise, the substitution of other muscles, and a decreased precision of performance. So now that we know how muscles work, we can finally talk about gait and walking. And before analyzing gait abnormalities, uh, I, just like how we need to know how normal muscles work, I think it's important to know what constitutes normal gait. Oh, I missed a slide. I apologize. Uh, before I go back about muscle fatigue, uh, some of the causes of muscle fatigue uh, are thought to be a decline in the energy molecule synthesis as the glycogen and the, uh, the materials that we bring in to produce that uh, ATP, the, uh, the uh, energy molecule is consumed. So when there's no more energy molecules to use, that's when fatigue occurs. There's an accumulation of lactic acid that produces the pain that we feel in the muscles. And there's also other uh, changes in metabolites at a cellular level as well, and not to get into more of the specifics. And then sometimes with other conditions, not polio, but with conditions such as myasthenia gravis, there can be a loss of the ability of the motor neuron to release acetylcholine, that neurotransmitter that makes the muscle fiber uh, contract. So going back to gait analysis, and so I wanted to just go briefly over why we walk the way we walk, and we need to know this before we can talk about uh, gait abnormalities. So normal gait is defined as a series of rhythmical alternating movements of the trunk and limbs, which result in the forward progression of the center of the gravity, the center of gravity and our body. And what's uh, unique about gait is that no matter how tall we are, how short we are, whatever the color our skins are, whether we're from China, whether we're from New Jersey, we all walk the same way in terms of what's ex when we're born and what we expect. And, and, well, and the phases we go through, it's all normal. It's only when things happen, such as the polio, that muscles don't work the right way. But this is the way that they're meant to work, and, and they work the same way for everywhere, everyone. So the concept of the center of gravity is what we're pushing forward when we move our bodies forward. Whether we're polio or not polio, we, to get from point A to point B, we have to get our, our center of gravity from point A to point B as well. And if we use our, the center of gravity, uh, because it's, uh, it's, it's easier to analyze gait and movement using this concept rather than the whole body. And the center of gravity is the point here, the point here where our mass is considered to be centered. And the position of the center of gravity here for why standing in a, in a, in a, in a person is uh, midway between the hips, which is looking from the side, and a few centimeters in front of the S2 uh, spinal level. So it's not in our pelvic area. But if we change position, the center of gravity changes. The position of the center of gravity actually as well. So if that person moves forward, the center of gravity is actually outside the body. 
So once you stand up, it's in here, and the center of gravity will change depending on the position of the person. And it's important because the the ideas of the least energy consumption is that the center of gravity travels in a straight line, but we'll, we'll see in normal days that's, that's not the case. So when we so when we move forward, if the center of gravity was in the center of this wheel here, then the center of gravity would just stay in a straight line. And that would uh, come into play if we're sitting in a wheelchair or being on a bicycle. Otherwise, we'll see what the center of gravity does when we walk. And we just give you an idea that you would see that it doesn't not go in a straight line. And this plays a role in energy consumption. Now, there are certain terms that are necessary at the divine gate for evaluation purposes. Uh, the gate cycle is important because uh, I want everyone to know what a clinician is evaluating when they, when someone like myself looks at gate, and when I watch, or some uh, physician watch, or a therapist watches somebody walk. So the gate cycle is a thing here. It's a single sequence of functions by one limb. So we're looking at one leg, not both of them at the same time, and it begins when the foot, uh, the heel hits the ground, and ends when the uh, same foot hits the ground again. And there are two components to the gait cycle. There's a stance phase when the back foot is on the ground, and a swing phase when the back foot is swinging through the air. And as I mentioned before, the, uh, the, the way the gait is evaluated is through observation. If you're in an academic center or you have uh, other more complex problems, then people can have their gait evaluated in a gait laboratory. But for most purposes, this is done in the doctor's office or with a therapist and, and watching somebody walk over a period of a space and looking for gait abnormalities. That's different from what we're talking about. So the stance phase, and just some uh, slides about what these different phases are. Stance phase begins at the instant one extremity contacts the ground and continues only as long as some portion is in contact and it's approximately 60 percent of the gait cycle. Whereas the swing phase begins as soon as the, the toe of that extremity leaves the ground and ceases just before the heel uh, strikes the ground or we on the same extremity and we put 40%. But we're not just in, but we're not just in, on stance phase and swing phase. We also have times when we're walking when both feet are on the ground. This is called double support. And um, this is when both limbs are on contact with the ground at the same time and it makes up about 22% of the gait cycle. And this phase is absent in running. And double support time increases in, in the elderly and those with balanced problems because we're obviously more stable with both feet on the ground. And it decreases with the speed, as the speed of walking increases. So as I mentioned, uh, running is defined as the lack of double support. And there are even subdivisions of the phases of uh, stance and swing. And these are used to help identify further where what muscles are being used during the gait cycle and where problems might arise. So not to go through all this, but just to give you a picture that people can divide, subdivide these different areas uh, and there are different terminologies for this. And then this is, there are also some components of the swing phase as well. Now what happens to our center of gravity when we look at somebody who's from the side when somebody's walking? So as I mentioned, it's not a straight line. Um, but it does go up and down in a sinusoidal uh, fashion. So you can see, sorry, you can see here that if someone had a marker on the side of their body and walked by this uh, chalkboard, the, the center of gravity is going up and down in this nice smooth sinusoidal fashion. And the average displacement up and down is about five centimeters. Its highest point is when we stand on one leg, and its lowest point is when we have both legs on the ground. And when we look at somebody from the front, then the pelvis also moves from side to side. Um, and, and the average displacement from side to side is also about five centimeters. And this is also a sinusoidal uh, pathway as well. So if you were able to look at both things together, uh, so picture A here is if you were looking from the front to somebody walking at you and what their pelvis is doing. And if you look from the side, this is what their center of gravity is doing going up and down then you can see that together our, our bodies are actually, the body is actually making a figure of eight movement of the center of gravity when you're looking at somebody from the front walking toward you. 
Okay, so it's really about movement of the center of gravity through space and to try to reduce uh, the energy, the amount of energy it takes to move our center of gravity. So, so this energy, this movement is the most energy efficient and explains how walking can be used for exercise because it takes energy to um, move our center of gravity up and down and from side to side. And I'll show a little more of that uh, in another slide. But however, if it wasn't for certain movements of our pelvis and our legs, and this is where the muscles come in, uh, our center of gravity would move through much greater excursions and use much more energy. So back in 1953, uh, the idea of, uh, of changes and movements of other parts of our legs and our pelvis were determined by uh, a fellow named Saunders and called gait determinants to optimize and to use to minimize the uh, excursion of the center of gravity in both this vertical and horizontal plane. And these determinants are represented by adjustments made, as I said, by the pelvis, the hips, the knees, and the ankles that help keep the movement of the body center of gravity to a minimum. And it's thought that by keeping these excursions to a minimum that the energy expenditure would be less and gait would be more efficient. And it implies on the other side that if it, if it isn't kept to this minimum, then you're going to use more energy to walk and to move your center of gravity from point A to point B. So these three determinant in case, just so you know what our, our bodies are doing when we walk, that we have pelvic rotation, pelvic tilt, lateral displacement of our pelvis from side to side, and, it did, and that all happens at our pelvis with the rotation and the movement from side to side, and whereas there is a flexion of our knee and stance phase, um, and then there's movement of our ankle and our foot that also help uh, smooth out the movement of that center of gravity. So now that we know how normal walking looks, then we can look at what the role of the muscles are in producing this movement and how we and how we utilize these determinants of gait. So we need to analyze the forces of, uh, that are on the body must uh, uh, control to produce the normal movements and balance. So this is a little bit of uh, mechanics, but it's very important when we talk about what our muscles are doing and what abnormal uh, gait can look like. So this involves the concept of a ground reaction force, and the forces that have the most influence when we're walking are gravity, um, how the muscles are contracting, inertia, which is the, uh, the movement that we have as we start moving, and the floor reaction pushing up against our body. So, so I'm going to talk more about uh, floor reaction because this is what comes into play with analyzing what the muscles do. So the floor reaction is the ground reaction force is the force that the foot exerts on the floor. I mean, against our foot when our foot uh, presses down on the floor. So it's the uh, reaction that opposes our, our body weight and the foot. Um, and it's uh, the understanding of the joint position and this uh, ground reaction force is important because it leads to the understanding of the muscle activity during the gait. And it's very important to understand, and this is uh, that the ground reaction force plays a role in what our muscles will do because when we look here in quiet stand, this is just a schematic of, of, a, of a leg in quiet standing, and this is the ground reaction force, which is just opposite our body weight, which would be at our center of gravity up here. So if we're standing quietly, the floor obviously has to push up against us so we don't go through the floor, and, if, and that's how we have that balance. But if, if you see this, this line here, if our ankle is here, whenever the ground reaction force is in front of a joint, it will tend to push the joint backwards, and if it's in front of a joint, it'll push the joint forward. And so when we're standing quietly, any of us, uh, if we can stand, then uh, you can see here at our ankle, this floor reaction is in front of the ankle joint. So this would tend to push our ankle forward, and if there wasn't something opposing it, we'd just fall backwards. So our, our, our calf muscle here is always active when we're standing quietly to oppose this uh, ground reaction force. So when we're standing quietly, all the muscles in our legs have no, no electrical activity at all. They're all quiet except for our calf muscle. So it's really quite a unique system that, that uh, we have. So this is a lot of pictures, and I don't want to get you too overwhelmed with the pictures because it took me several years to figure out what all this what all this meant. But I but it's uh, but I want to present it because um, it, it, there are a couple of things on here that present itself in gait abnormalities that I think are worthwhile to know. And again, it has to do with um, the uh, ground reaction force at some of these sub. Uh, 
phases of the uh, of our gate. And so what I want to just show basically is here uh, in initial contact, when our heel hit first hits the floor, the ground reaction force is below, is behind our ankle. And, and you know when, uh, when we walk, our foot comes down, so our foot hits the floor in a flat way. And that if this muscle in the front here is weak, that our foot slaps, or sometimes people have a steppage gait, they have to pick their foot up so they can um, uh, clear their foot. But if this muscle is normal, then it has an eccentric contraction to allow the foot to come down slowly and gradually. So this is where the idea of eccentric versus concentric contractions come in. And the same thing in when our foot hits the ground, our knee bends. And because our knee bends, this floor reaction also is behind our knee. And because it's behind our knee, as I said, when it's behind a joint, it will push our, the joint forward. So if there's nothing to counteract that pushing forward, our knee will buckle when we step forward forward and our knee bends. So this is a more like a controlled fall that we have when we when we walk normally because our knee bends and we don't fall. And, and that happens because our quadriceps, our thigh muscle, will have an eccentric contraction to prevent a smooth uh, flexion of our knee joint uh, to allow it to come to the proper position without buckling. So that, that this is again where eccentric contractions come in and that the amount of force that has to be generated by the muscle is much higher when it has to do these activities. And the last place I just want to show you is here in pre-swing when our toes start to come off the ground that our our, uh, the ground reaction force now is in front of our ankle, and again, that would cause our ankle to collapse. But we want to push off, so we have to use our calf muscles again to push off. And uh, this time it's in, in a concentric and a shortening contraction to push our foot downward and to uh, offset the uh, effect of it trying to move in the other direction. Okay. And uh, the, so the, the take home point in this was is that we use eccentric contractions when we walk and that those eccentric contractions, as we'll see later, can have to use higher forces than, than concentric contractions. And this will play a role when we think about exercising these muscles. So this is just a, uh, a graph that shows how the muscles are used during the gait cycle and that you can see that the muscles turn on and off throughout our gait cycle and that there are times when uh, muscles uh, overlap but, but uh, and sometimes when they're just uh, single muscles being used here just as our ankle plantar flexors and here are our ankle our shin muscles okay So now we can look at uh, some common gait abnormalities. And as I said, the evaluation of gait abnormalities is usually done by clinical observation. And while there may just be a single abnormality that somebody might have, uh, often there are multiple changes occurring because of multiple muscles that are involved. So the kind of the most common gait abnormalities that, that are seen clinically are an antalgic gait, which is a gait due to pain, um, lateral truck bending, which is bending to the oh, from one side or the other, um, a leg length discrepancy, um, a uh, longer walking base, um, inadequate dorsiflexion control, which is uh, not being able to control one's ankle, and excessive knee extension. And what I see uh, most commonly with people who come in for an evaluation uh, in, in the context we're talking about here are the uh, lateral truck bend, trunk bending, uh, the leg length discrepancy, the uh, inadequate ankle control, and the excessive knee extension. So I just want to show uh, what these are about. Uh, you, you see these pictures and some of them may uh, hit home with you. Uh, lateral trunk bending is called the Trendelenburg gait. Um, it is usually unilateral, but if it's bilateral, you can see somebody waddling back and forth. So that's not a very uh, probably um, uh, politically correct term, but that that's what's been used in the past but but the most common causes are either pain in the hip uh, but from what we see in, in our context here, weakness in the hip abductor muscle, uh, possibly a leg length discrepancy or some abnormality in the hip joint itself, such as arthritis. And there are two types of Trendelenburg gaits. There's a compensated one where the person leans towards the affected side, the side with the weakness, and an uncompensated Trendelenburg gait where the person doesn't lean over and the pelvis drops off to the opposite side. 
And the treatment for this is the use, it's very simple, it's the use of, if that's the only problem, it's the use of a cane to compensate for the weakness in that hip abductor, the muscle on the side of our body that holds our body up when we stand in on one leg. The next, uh, leg, the next uh, uh, gait abnormality that is commonly seen is a leg length discrepancy. Um, this is a problem because one leg is longer than the other, so oftentimes the leg will catch when you try to swing it through. So there have to be some compensatory mechanism that happens uh, automatically to try to uh, prevent the toe from getting caught and causing falling. So uh, some, the most common compensations are either circumduction where the person will bring the leg all the way out to the side and then sweep it around on and back in an arc. Uh, hip hiking, to just bring the leg up uh, by leaning over to the opposite side. Uh, a steppage gait, where one picks the leg up to, to try to clear the toe and vaulting up and down. And the, most, and the most common way to manage a leg length discrepancy is with the use of a lift to try to even out those, uh, the, the, the leg length, uh, length lengths themselves. Uh, the next uh, most commonly seen uh, uh, gait abnormality is that of uh, uh, weakness in the ankle uh, muscles, uh, primarily in the muscle in the front, the anterior tibialis muscle. And this can present in two different ways. One, in uh, the stance phase when the heel first hits the ground, and I mentioned that we use this muscle in an eccentric fashion to bring the foot down slowly, so there's a nice gentle bringing the foot down to the floor. Uh, if that muscle does, can't generate that kind of higher forces, then the, the foot will slap down. And you've probably seen people have a, a foot slap. And that's because the muscle can't uh, generate the forces to bring it down gently. Whereas in the swing phase, um, if the muscle isn't strong enough to hold the foot up, then the, the toe will drop. And uh, as I said, that's usually due to a weak uh, anterior tibialis muscle. And this is a steppage gait where somebody's trying to move their foot forward and they have to pick the foot up to allow clearance of the toe to prevent falling. And the treatment for this, if this is it by itself, is usually with a brace to hold the foot up in the correct position. The type of AFO, the ankle foot orthosis, um, or PLS stands for posterior leaf spring, uh, depends on the degree of weakness and the instability at the joint. So if it's just some mild weakness, it can be uh, much more flexible. If there's a lot of instability, then it might need to be more rigid. And this takes sometimes some work with the orthotist, the fellow making the, or woman making the brace, to determine what's the right amount of support. So one feels they have the support, but they're not feeling too rigidly uh, held into the brace, which can cause its own problems. And finally, uh, there's excessive knee extension that happens during uh, the, the mid-stance phase, as I mentioned, where the knee, because there's a loss of normal knee flexion, and the knee may go into hyperextension. This is called genu recurvatum, and that uh, just means hyperextension of the knee. And uh, common causes, and in our context, is usually from quadriceps weakness that you see in mid-stance when the foot hits the floor and the knee should be bending a little bit if that muscle is not strong enough and it also is an eccentric contraction, so it has to produce higher forces, and if it can't do that, then the knee is going to automatically go backwards to find a more stable position uh, because everything is done automatically to keep us from falling and ending up on the ground. So there's some pictures of, uh, of a hyperextension of the knee. If you look at, at, at the line through the center, you can see that this person's knee is, is already extending backwards. Um, and that the other leg, the normal leg over here, is slightly bent because this knee, when we're standing with the knee not bent, it's actually longer. So this knee has to, has to is shorter. So this knee has to bend to bring the whole body into a, a level position. The treatment for the hyperextension of the knee are yeah, braces again to try to hold the knee in a, in a normal position. If there's uh, not enough strength in the quadriceps muscle that the knee will uh, still buckle, then a, a long leg brace, a KAFO, a knee ankle foot, or, foot orthosis is uh, necessary to provide the support. However, if there's enough uh, strength in the quadriceps muscle, but not normal strength that somebody has can still have some control over the knee, but not complete, then uh, what's called the floor reaction AFO can be used. And uh, this is something that has an anterior tibia. 
sorry, has an anterior tibial shell here so that if somebody does lose their balance or does start to have some flexion of their knee and won't be able to hold themselves, this anterior tibial shell can basically catch them from falling. Okay. So, so now that we've talked about muscle fatigue and we've talked about why the way we walk, the way we do, I want to, and looking at what gait abnormalities uh, exist and what we can do to treat them, I also I want to now talk a little bit about energy expenditure during ambulation. And um, this uh, relates more to the issues of fatigue in general that we have, that we, not we have, that can be uh, developed in terms of being tired in general versus the local muscle fatigue I, I mentioned earlier. So we know that any uh, now, as I presented, any deviation from the norm in terms of walking will cause an increase in the movement of the center of gravity, and that that will take more energy to uh, allow to produce that movement. So I want to give some information about what it actually costs in terms of energy uh, to walk. And this will give us some information as to why recommendations are made for resting and pacing. So this is a, um, a table with the energy costs of light activities in adults. And this, uh, while this says E is energy expenditure, it's the same thing as a metabol uh, basal metabolic rate or a metabolic equivalent, as sometimes talked about in cardiac rehab, where it's uh, and it's determined in terms of it's determined by uh, measuring oxygen consumption, and that the uh, base level of one is in quiet lying here. So that anything that's more than quiet lying uses up more energy. And that walking at a normal speed, which is down here, and I'll show you a graph about normal walking, it uses uh, 4.3 kilocalories per minute, whereas walking slowly uses less. But you can see even that sitting and riding uses up more energy than lying quietly. The only thing that uses less is sleeping. And it's been known that if this number is more than five, that that, that kind of activity uh, cannot be sustained without rest in an untrained person. I mean, you can train yourself to do that, but an untrained person, if this number goes higher than this, you can't uh, sustain the activity. These activities have been sustained by most people, most normal people. So if we look at walking here, that when we measure walking in terms of the energy expenditure per unit time, that, that it goes up as you walk faster. This is in meters per minute or in terms of miles per hour. If you walk faster, that you use up more energy. However, if you look at the amount of energy that's used in terms of how, how much energy you use per the distance that you walk, that it, it develops, a, it flattens out down here. And that looking at walking speed as a as a as a matter of the distance that you walk that the most comfortable walking speed for a normal person is here at 80 meters per minute which comes out to about three miles an hour so more normal people walking walk between takes about a, uh, 15 to 20 minutes to walk a mile and we walk at that because that's the most energy efficient uh, least energy used to walk and anything walking faster or slower uses up more energy uh, for the distance that you walk. And intuitively that makes sense. If you walk slower, you're using up less energy, but you have to take more time to get to where you want to go. So, and I know I've talked with people that when you're on your trip and everyone's out there and you're back here walking slowly, it's because you can't go any faster and you're using up more energy because it's just taking you longer you're not using up more energy for the distance you walk, but it's just taking you so much longer, you're using up more energy cumulatively to get there. So we walk normally at three miles, between three and four miles an hour. So what does that mean for people who have other disabilities? And there have been studies looking at the effects of hemiplegia on, and comparing that to normal subjects. And looking at this, you can see that uh, the amount of energy used is higher for the people with a, with a, with a hemipre hemipretic limb, and this is the norm. So again, the arrow is normal walking speed, and you can see here the most comfortable walking speed here for someone with a hemiplegia uh, is less already, and they don't even reach a, a, a place where it flattens out. And then looking at uh, paraplegics walking, 
um, they're looking at, at them that when they try to analyze their amount of energy that they use, that when they walk with either crutches or a walker and uh, long leg braces, and these are these are spinal cord injuries, not polio people who have paraplegia, which is a, a completely different uh, uh, topic, I think. Um, because, yeah, but these people with new spinal cord injuries, recovering from spinal cord injuries, and if they're paraplegic, you can see the amount of energy that it takes to walk. We hear normal walking here is down here less than one. We already talked about it being about four at a normal walking speed. Whereas here, you can see up here, it's uh, above, it's in the five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten range. So, at, and they're walking very slowly, you know, ten to ten to ten meters per minute. So there's immense amounts of energy that are used when you're not walking normally. There was a study that looked at the relationship between crutch walking, this is using normal people walking with crutches, and comparing that to normal walking without the crutches. And again, it, it took more energy to walk per minute with the crutches, and this is normal people, than it did uh, without the crutches. And then we come to a study that was done looking at the effects of uh, uh, propelling a wheelchair on a smooth level surface and comparing that to normal walking. And that uh, it's very interesting because if you look at the net energy used, that the person walking used more energy than the person in the wheelchair. And intuitively, that makes sense because you're not moving your center of gravity up and down, but it's going through a straight line. So the only energy that's being used uh, on a brief period of time is your arms, or if, or if you have a power chair, you're not even, then there's no energy being used by your body, you know, then it'd be just like you're from sitting. But, but you use up more energy walking walking than propelling a wheelchair on a smooth, on, just on a smooth level surface. But if you look at the heart rate, because you're, you, one's using their arms, the heart rate is higher in propelling the wheelchair than in walking. So what does that all mean for uh, recommendations for the management of post-polio syndrome. So um, I, instead of making this into separate slides, I thought this gave a nice presentation, even though there's a lot on it, about the evidence-based uh, treatment that's available for, that's thought of now for people with uh, post-polio syndrome. And I just wanted to uh, point out here that under generalized fatigue, which we were just talking about, that is to prescribe appropriate lower extremity orthoses, and that there is evidence-based treatment that this is a benefit. And again, going back to the idea that we want to try to normalize gait as much as possible, that will help reduce the energy consumption that's being used. It's not perfect, and some people can do it and some people can't, but in terms of trying to make a, an effort at doing this, it's, it's part of the treatment that we need to look at. Okay. And then when we look at uh, other issues with generalized fatigue in terms of uh, energy conservation, it, it comes in with uh, generalized fatigue, muscle weakness to institute physical activity with pacing, with rest periods for the issues that, we, that I presented and talked about in terms of muscle fatigue and how our muscles work, and to avoid the overuse of weakened muscles. And, and I bring this up uh, a little bit also because uh, I'm often asked uh, if, if someone can strengthen their muscles uh, so they can walk normally. And I wanted to present this information also because often the, the kind of exercises in terms of specificity often don't work in terms of trying to strengthen the muscles enough to do what normal gait does for us. So it's a matter of understanding uh, how the muscles work, what these eccentric versus concentric contractions are, and what our limitations are especially if one is going to do non-fatiguing uh, muscle exercises, you're not going to be able to generate the kind of forces in the muscle to provide for normal gait. So just to let you know what happened to the, uh, the person that I saw at the beginning, so my initial recommendations were that she uses the rolling walker at all times. She, I use a left uh, AFO, floor reaction brace, or possibly a, a long leg brace for the weakness in her left leg that was severely affected, and a, a flexible uh, short leg brace for the weakness in the right ankle. I was recommended she begin pacing activities in more frequent rest periods. I started her on Cymbalta to help manage her chronic pain uh, more acutely. I uh, recommended that she have a sleep study, a swallow evaluation, and she apply for Social Security disability. 
And one year later, uh, for and follow up, she was on social security disability and had not returned to work. She was doing a better job at pacing her activities during the day with rest breaks. Uh, she was using the rolling walker at all times and, and reported that her fatigue had improved. Uh, with this pacing and using the rolling walker all the time, the strength had improved in her right ankle and she did not need a brace on that side. But she continued to have weakness in the left knee uh, and had not yet uh, gone in further with uh, uh, trying to obtain a brace. But she did complain of less pain in her left knee uh, with the more chronic pain probably uh, due to arthritis from the chronic instability. Her chronic pain was also better with the Cymbalta and although she hadn't had a sleep study, we had talked about other ways to help with her sleep and she was trying Elevil, uh, which was helping her sleep uh, uh, as well. She hadn't yet uh, attended uh, or gone to physical therapy or had her swallow a valve. So some final thoughts. Um, I, I think that a consistent approach to the management of post-polio syndrome has been developed over time with the presence of evidence-based treatment recommendations that we've seen in this slide. I hope, though, uh, therefore, through this presentation, we have seen a scientific basis for some of these recommendations, whether you ambulate by walking or by wheels. Uh, for all the science, though, there is still the art of uh, medicine to consider, uh, which I think is just important in the management of healthy lives, as is the science. I believe that this is vitally important to the management of post-polio syndrome and that we as physicians need to listen to your stories in order to develop a relationship that will allow you to feel safe, comfortable, and confident to make major changes in your life, both physically and emotionally. Uh, this is, I think, the secret to outstanding medical care and should be required of everyone you work with in this journey, including not only the doctor, but also everyone else who becomes part of your team, such as the orthotist, the therapist, and if you have one, uh, your psychologist. If they are not listening to you, then you might want to find someone who does. Of course, that doesn't absolve you of the need to listen to your doctor, too. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So I, I think there was supposed to be some time for questions. There's no, there, well, there's no evidence that there's any recurrence of virus at all, and there's never been any studies that have shown any immunological basis for having had the polio and that causing some damage to nerves or muscles from, from that immunological response from the initial polio infection. And I think those doctors aren't going to, not that they would come to this conference, but going to other, you know, uh, continuing medical education or reading or knowing what, what this, uh, this is about. Well, it's just a, it's, it's, a, it's a chance for you to do some education. If you have the, the kind, depending on who the doctor is, your relationship with the doctor, I think doctors like to, if they're wrong, hopefully most doctors, you know, want to learn something. It's something that I know a lot of people who have post post syndrome and go to have surgery have to do this kind of education with their anesthesiologists and sometimes with their other doctors. You know, or or the or doctors like myself. I have relationships with doctors in the community I'm working with. I'm in, and sometimes other doctors, internists, other doctors see people who are having symptoms such as yourself and this story, and they they send them to me. Uh, I just have some, some questions uh, looking forward in the future. Is that possible to scale? Well, um, I, that I don't know the answer to. I haven't seen anything about stem cell research in, in this area. Um, 
Um, my guess is, is also the, and we were talking about ending polio and, and uh, the, epidemio, uh, the epidemiology of polio and your cohort is that you're, you know, in a good way is getting smaller over time and that hopefully in the future we're not going to need this in, anyways. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware of stem cells, you know, being used or even people doing this kind of research to look at by uh, trying to renew uh, muscle and motor, motor strength. Because the problem is, is that even if you get the anterior horn cells, you know, regenerated, you have to be able to have a, a cell in your spinal cord, then create a, an axon, uh, and have a connection between that nerve, that cell, and the and the and the muscle itself. And we know from other injuries to nerves, uh, traumatic injuries or stretch injuries, that that it's not a one-to-one. -one um, a relationship to having some recovery, and usually it's not. So it's it's it's. It, I don't know of that being a uh, an option. Yeah, I, it, I'm not sure, you know, not seeing it, exactly what the problem is, how far forward the foot plate comes. Yeah. You know, if, if it needs to come forward so your toes don't, mm -hmm. sure, they can come all the way forward and include all your toes so your toes sit flat on the, on the, on the plastic. So just tell them if they make Yes, I, I, think, I think working with orthotists, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you have to be an ad, like anything, you have to be your own advocate. If you're not, especially if you're working with somebody who hasn't worked with a lot of people with polio related impairments. And a lot of times, you know, people, that's why I was saying at the end, you have to have somebody who's willing to listen to be part of your team. And if they're just telling you, you know, tough, you know, that's, that's not an acceptable answer. Like, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Um, and I had a, uh, a wrist fracture in my uh, loose arm, and uh, well, I can't regain whatever it's going to take. So I have to go to the doctor. Well, you know, we know that having acute injuries like a fracture will affect, you know, the the polio, you know, involved um, nerves and muscles. If you were immobilized, you get one can have weakness just from the immobilization itself, and adding all that together, you can have more weakness. So, you if you do the exercises appropriately, you can get back some strength. Uh, whether it's enough to do what you did before, that's a different. You know, that you'll have to wait and see. Yeah, over there. Yeah. Well, okay, she was asking, she was saying, you never came back to, I only saw you once? Okay, I, I, I apologize for not remembering. That was the first time. Yes. I, it's not, it's, it, it, yes, I, when I do my evaluation, and I think any good evaluation by a physician has to be looking at the, the uh, in a musculoskeletal examination, you want to look at all the muscles or muscle groups and see what the strength is and where the things are strong, where things are weak. And that includes our hands, and a lot of people will complain about weakness in their hands or our gradual weakness in their hands. And so I look at these muscles and that, that control our fingers. And these little muscles that control our fingers are consistently, and I've never seen a study, I haven't done a study where I've looked at a cohort, you know, and compare this to normal. So it's more of just a clinical observation on my part that people who have a neuropathy, which is what post-polio syndrome is, a motor neuropathy where the nerves have been damaged and affect how the muscles work. So whether it's polio, I've seen it in people with diabetes who have neuropathies as well, or other conditions that cause motor, motor damage, um, that the little muscles in the hands, because they're so little, and we talked about fatigue and overuse, 
and 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 the kind of fiber types that these muscles have because they're used quickly and we don't constantly use if you try to squeeze something a lot of times you know I squeeze a bottle or something to, to for spraying something after a while I get it gets tired very quickly so these these little muscles t fatigue very quickly they have probably more of a propensity of these type 2 fast twitch fibers that 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 that, that fatigue quickly and if you're using them over years and years they're going to not be able to keep up with that demand and these muscles get weak and while clinically you may not see it in terms of what you do day to day you know there may be some weakness in holding on to a key or pinching a key or doing some of these kind of activities that we use specifically these little muscles in our hands for and so I'm testing and these muscles become weak so I use it as a clinical guide that there's even if all the other muscles are I test are nor have normal strength on a manual muscle test and inevitably the, these little intrinsic muscles in the hands are weak and so it gives me at least something to hold on to when someone says, well, every, all the muscles are strong and normal, and how could they have had polio? And, you know, that's sitting there as a sign of something that's not right. Okay. Oh, either one. Yeah. Um, you Well, every well, everything's a little different for everybody, depending on the amount of weakness, the amount of muscle fibers that you have, what kind of exercising you're doing. As I mentioned, exercises has to be specified in terms of what you want to do. Well, right. Well, I think it depends on on who you're working with and what you're doing and listening to your you or the therapist being able to listen to your body. It's much easier. The studies are shown to strengthen muscles that have are that still have anti-gravity strength that you can pick up against gravity. So there's more muscle fibers obviously still present to, to, to be able to move it against the forces of gravity. So there have been studies that have not, you know, nothing is 100% and everything can be on a bell curve. But if you, and, and, and scientific studies are based on looking at uh, statistical significances, which means that there's more of a chance that it's really happening than just by chance. So it doesn't mean it happens to everybody. So, but the studies have shown that, that if you, if you, nobody I've read in any of the studies and looking at uh, exercise and post-polio uh, people uh, have, have said any, have recommended exercising the way I would exercise. It has to be done judiciously, it has to be done with therapists that understand who they're working with and what the muscle status is, and that you listen to your body just like you need to rest and take breaks during the day if you're getting tired. When you're exercising, you have to understand what is too much. Well, those muscles may not, you know, be amenable to strengthening in your legs. You can't, as I mentioned before, in just looking at the kinds of contractions that we have, that the bulk of the contractions in our legs, uh, however we were created to do this, are these lengthening contractions to prevent uh, rapid movements into an unsafe position, especially with our knees. Because if the muscle doesn't lengthen, our quadriceps will fall, you'll fall. So if the muscle's not strong enough, then you're not gonna be able to strengthen it. So you have to look at what, what's, what's realistic to do and go from there. And it doesn't mean that it works for everybody. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Our, and our, as I mentioned, in the functions of the muscles, we use skeletal, our same skeletal muscles that we use in our arms and our legs for breathing. And breathing is uh, breathing in is an active um, activity. We have to use our diaphragm to pull to to pull our to 
fold it down and to bring our air in. The breathing out is a passive activity. We just, the elastic recoil pushes the air out, but we need to use these muscles. And if the diaphragm is weak, then we start using, you've seen people who have trouble breathing, we can start seeing their neck muscles. We use rib muscles to try to pull the air in. So it's the same, the exact same problem. Are you familiar with this uh, Ontario medical study that's out there now about um, it's a clinical nurse that's uh, taking some evaluations, but also a swab test that you're taking inside the mouth and then sending back to Ontario? I'm, they, I'm not aware of it, but no, I'm not aware of it. I'll, I'll research it and see what I can find. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know what, what they're looking for. Yeah. For a second part question, uh, mostly out of curiosity, uh, through Pennsylvania, the post polio network group, there was by the state of Pennsylvania a, a receipt of the polio shots that we would give as kids. Mm -hmm. Do you know if New Jersey State Health had that type of record since some of us cannot get a hold of our St. Michael's Hospital records? I, I well. It, the, well, the question hadn't come up to me before, so I, I'm, the question had not come up to me before, so I, I'm not aware of that. And I usually take, you know, people, I mean, sometimes it's obvious you have polio, sometimes not so obvious, and I take people, you know, I think the experiences people have gone through are pretty well blazoned in your mind, either as a child or growing up or what you've been told or as a young adult that, you know, I take people at their word about whether, you know, you have polio or not. I don't see any reason to doubt it. The fact that we had polio, this card actually had uh, the date records of the three shots. Yeah. And the, the most interesting thing was the, the vaccination serial numbers. Oh, um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not aware of it. Okay. Is it rare or unusual for a person to get to 70, get to 60 or 70 years? If you were going to get it, would it be most likely you would have it before then? I don't, I don't think so. I think it can be any amount of time. And again, everything is on, uh, to me in science, everything is on a bell curve. And while most people may be in that 30, I mean, originally they were talking 15 years. So now I think more people would say 30, 20, 30, 40 years I see, I think 60, 70 years. I think it, I think it can be anything in that continuum. It depends on how affected your muscles were, once muscles were initially, how active you were during your life, how you paced yourself. There are a lot of different variables that would go into you know, the onset of this. I think. And I just want to say one other thing about exercise um, that, that as a corollary to what uh, the other uh, uh, lady was bringing up, that even if you can't exercise for strengthening muscles, we should be aware, because people ask me all the time, well, I shouldn't exercise. You know, there are benefits to exercising in terms of finding what you can do, but for cardiovascular purposes, for managing cholesterol, managing diabetes, these kinds of things, and, and these systems I mentioned that also come into play when we exercise, that trying to exercise to, to some degree, if you can, you know, has healthy benefits. You know, it may be that you don't exercise to the degree you want to, but I think that there, it's something that one should think of because you'll have a cardiologist saying, what, you're not exercising. I think our time is up. Well, I'll be around, you know, the, you know <laughs> to the rest of the afternoon. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Zimmerman.